Now, we have the model of the Bohr atom. The Bohr atom has the nucleus at the middle, the electrons on the outside. And those electrons are placed into orbits because of uh, their spectra and the energy that they give off in their spectra. So it, Bohr quantized them, said they have to be here or they have to be here, one place or another. Now the problem with Bohr's model, catastrophe is one of them, that if it's circling around like that, it's going to spiral into the nucleus and explode and be gone in a millionth of a second. What Bohr did incorrectly is he tried to fabricate the electron. He wanted to say the electron is here in space. This particular orbit as it circles around just like the planets around the sun. And the problem is you can't do that. You can't locate an electron at one particular space spot in space in time. It's impossible to do because they're so small, because they're moving so fast. You have to deal with more of the quantum effects. Uh, when Bohr came up with his idea, quantum was in his very infancy as a science. It developed over the next, well, up until now, still developing, I guess, but it developed much more in the next 20, 30 years. And because it developed more, we change the model of the atom. The Bohr model is still a good visualization of what does an atom look like, but it doesn't completely solve the whole picture. All right. Einstein came up with the idea through the photoelectric effect that light acts like a particle. He talked about its photons coming in, and the photons coming in and, and uh, kicking out electrons. Now, in science, there's something you know called reflectivity. That if a part, if a wave can act like a particle, then a particle should act like a wave. J. J. Thompson. He discovered the electron, right? He discovered the electron using the CRT, talked about it as a, it's a particle. Interestingly enough, he won a Nobel Prize for that, for discovering the electron and talking about it as a particle. His son, George, later won a Nobel Prize. It's one of the few father-son teams uh, of Nobel Prize winners. And his research deal with an electron acting like a wave. So absolutely the opposite properties. You can imagine they probably had some interesting discussions at their house. Maybe. Now, the next guy that's really important for us though is a guy by the name of Louis de Bry, the Broglie if you want. Uh, and that, that is his shortened name. His name is actually about five, six names long. He was a prince and all this stuff. But he said the electron propagates through space as an energy wave. To understand the atom, one must understand the behavior of electromagnetic waves. Don't write that down. But right, he is important. What he did was he said, okay, if a if a wave such as light can act like a particle, a photon, then particles should also act like waves and we should be able to describe them. Now to orderly act like a wave, that was 1924 he said that, here's the important thing about Louis, is he said that electrons and actually all particles must act like a wave to have the same behavior. They would have what he called quantized wavelengths. Certain wavelengths are the only ones that could fit, the only ones that could work. Uh, if we talk about music and waves, you can get a, you can have a 
fundamental notes, lowest notes, and then it, all notes are, you know, uh, harmonics of those, of the fundamentals. If I take my spring and my hang on to it, over there. If I take my spring and I want to set a wave up into it, now not just a pulse like that, but I want to get what's called a standing wave, a wave that repeats itself. I can get a wave that looks, i got to tighten up a little bit, that looks like that. Okay? Now how many wavelengths do I have? Not one. I actually have half of one. Because if I were to freeze it, I would freeze it and it would, no, put your hands down. I would freeze it and it would be up. It's either up or down, right? It's either a crest or a trough. Not that far down. It's either a crest or a trough, right? And in order to have a full wave, I have to have a crest and a trough. So I've got half a wavelength that I could have. Now, if I advance that, so that would be our fundamental. If I advance that, now how many waves do I have? Two. Oh, one. I've got a crest and a trough. If I were to freeze at any point in time, this half would be up, that half would be down. Or that half would be up, this half would be down. Now in order to get that first harmonic, it's called, what did I have to do? Again, we'll go back to the fundamental. Harder? Faster. I had to wave it faster. I had to increase my frequency. Okay? So if I wanted to go to the next harmonic, what would I have to do? move even faster. How many waves would I have then? One and a half. Oh, I, I went too fast. I go fast enough, aha, you do it. You act like it's easy over there. Come on, you do it. You go like this. No, faster, not harder. Uh, all right, now that is very important because can you shake your hand at just any speed and get it to happen? If I don't shake it fast enough, can I get a wave to establish itself? No. They've got to be a certain frequency, a certain wavelength. They go. They go. They go. Sit down. <laughs> I've got to have a certain frequency, a certain wavelength. If I don't have that wavelength, it doesn't establish itself. So what he said in dealing with the quantum in that they had to be a certain energy, energy is frequency, we talked about that with waves, it had to be, in order to have these certain energies that Bohr was talking about, you had to have certain frequencies or certain wavelengths of the wave. If it didn't fit into those, it couldn't be there. So a wave could, or a, we would say an electron could either have this wavelength or it could have this wavelength or it could have this wavelength. Of these three, which one would be a higher energy? The third one. This would be the highest energy over here. Next, and this would be the lowest. Could they ever be in between? No. So it's exactly fitting into what Bohr was thinking, certain energies, but approaching it, looking at the, at the electron as a wave, not a particle. This is another drawing of the same kind of thing, where here's my fundamental. This would be like a guitar string vibrating at its lowest frequency. It's next highest. It's next highest. 
we would have to try and fit these into circular orbits. So you could get 5, 3, 6. But if I wanted to do a fractional amount, it's not going to work. So either you had a whole number of multiples or you didn't. So you had even energies or not. The next person to come along, so De Bruyne came up with the whole idea, electrons could act like waves. And you have to then look at their properties that way. The next thing, person to come along, was a guy by the name of Werner Heisenberg. He was a German physicist. Brilliant. They all were. Uh, and he came up with what's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Now, and the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. What it says is you can't know where it is. Or if you do know where it is, you, you don't know where it's going. Or if you know where it's going, you don't know where it is. Does that make sense? No, not yet. Let me get some toys. Now, what do I have here? A real man's basketball. That's right. How do you know I have, where is it? Where? Where? Point to it. It's right there. It's right here, right? How do you know that? Because you can see it. Now, what actually happens in order for you to see something? 